the team asked me to preach on Jesus loves. And uh, I thought, wow, no problem with that. Because when you can talk about the love of God, um, that's an easy subject to talk about, especially on Easter. Because the big question is, does God love us? I've been, I was at Starbucks the other day and they were singing the song, uh, they had the song playing, He's a Good, Good Father. And I'm thinking about the fact that for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. See, when you go back to the bottom line of who we are all, what we're all about, it's not about buildings or about success, it's not about money or cars, all those things are fine. It's all about how much we love one another. And the Bible talks about this in, in John chapter 15. It was really the last teachings of Jesus before he was betrayed. And I want you to go to verse 9. He says, just as the Father has loved me, I've also loved you. And remain in my love. So we're finding out a couple things here. He says that the Father loved him. Now some of us don't you ever try to explain the Trinity. It's a pretty hard thing to do. But the concept here is, is Jesus said he was loved by his Father. And he says, I'm going to love you the exact same way. You know, as a counselor, I was a counselor for many years, but as a leadership trainer, I've seen this over and over again. People usually love the way they were loved growing up. Unless there's been a radical transformation in their life and they reconnect with someone else that can teach them to love. I can honestly say that when I think about the fact that Jesus loves, he does. And, 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 but he learned to love from his father and then he transferred it to us. He says, if you obey my commandments, you will remain in my love just as I've obeyed my father's commandments and remain in his love. Now a lot of people say to me, Paul, is this, is this conditional? No, as a parent... You're raising your children to obey you. You love them. Uncon How many of you have kids? Anybody have kids here? A lot of us have kids, right? Anybody have grandkids? Denise and I have 10. We have number 11 on the way. And I can honestly say that my number one job as a grandparent, because I don't have to do a lot of the disciplining. Most of what I do is give them candy and love them. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> There's a testimony right there. So on Easter Sunday, what I want to tell you about is that Jesus does love you, and that means something. I, I remember what Heidi Baker said one time, and it really rocked me. He says, love looks like something. Because we try to make Jesus about religion. We try to make God about religion, and sometimes religion gets in the way. Because honestly, it's all about relationship. And he says he learned how to love by his daddy, and now he loves us in the same way. And he says, remain in this love but make sure you obey my commandments. Because the commandments are never to restrict you. They're always to protect you. And what happens about obedience is when you move away from obedience, you walk away from his love. It's like a rebellious son or daughter. Have you ever had a rebellious son or daughter? Did you ever see them suffer the consequences of their own decisions? Yeah. You hate it, don't you? As a parent, you'd give your left arm or your right arm to help them get out of that addiction. You'd give, their, you'd give everything. I've seen parents spend $20,000 for one month of rehab. I've seen parents mortgage their home to get their kids into a therapy program or something of the sort. Because as a parent, you just love. But what you, want, you, you know that if they walk away from your commandments, and the word there is a great word in, in the Greek, it's, it's the word principles and, and truths. When you walk away from principles and truths, you're walking away from love. There's a great book that was written called Tough Love. And some of us as parents have had to practice that through the years. Tough love is never easy. It just says there's certain things you can do that will cause you to walk away from a safe place of love. So when you look at the scriptures here, God's love is unconditional. It's infinite. It's unswerving. It's eternal. Now if you were never raised like that, Chances are you have a hard time loving people unconditionally. The word used there is, of course, the word agape, which is unconditional love. So when you look at the word here, it's very, very clear that, that you and I are called to love others the way God loved us, the way Jesus loved us, because that was the way that he was loved by his Father. You ever heard of the term trickle-down economy? Well, this is trickle-down love. See, the problem is if you were never loved growing up, you don't know how to love. And there's going to be something radical that will have to happen in your life for you to finally begin to love yourself and love others the way God calls you to do. And that's why you actually came on a good day. This is Resurrection Sunday. 
Yeah. Thank you, three of you that are excited about that principle. Yeah. And this is his last teaching. He says, he says, I have loved you. A lot of people don't realize that Jesus loves you. We sang it in Sunday school as kids. If you were raised in an evangelical or a Baptist church or a Pentecostal church, Jesus loves me. Because the Bible tells me so. My mom is 96, in and out of dementia. She sings that a lot. Because she's really close to heaven right now. And, and what gives her, it's scary to die. It's scary to, to have fits of dementia. It's scary, but my mom reverts back to that song often. And I'll sing it with her sometimes just to bring her comfort. You see, because Jesus does love you. And he's shown your, his love to you in so many, in hundreds of ways. Anybody breathing here? Guess what? He loves you. He's giving you another chance to have a relationship with him today. You came to church today. He loves you. You're healthy enough to walk and to talk. And I've been in the hospital a lot recently, and I've seen a lot of people who couldn't walk and talk anymore. And so I can tell you that, that Jesus loves me. This I know. And see, he died for you, but he rose again. See, if he only died for you, that'd be a beautiful sacrifice, but have no eternal impact on your life except for inspiration. The fact we believe in res the resurrection tells me, and tells all of us, that because he loves me, he still loves me. Because he loves me, he wants to do something dynamic in my life, in my family's life, in my business, in my church, in my school, in my country. Anybody still with me? So Jesus loves you, and he shows it. And I, last night I was praying, actually this morning also for a couple hours, and I had this question. I didn't have my original notes, but so what? You know, you ever tell someone that Jesus loves them, they, they just cuss you out? I've done street witnessing before, and I've had people just get mad at me. And the more I try to love them in Jesus, the more they hate me. Try it. You'll like it. But the beautiful thing is, it makes me think of this fact. So what? So what that Jesus loves me? Well, first of all, you have to believe in the resurrection for the next part. You have to. If there's no resurrection, Paul says, we're to be pitied among all people. Because Paul was giving everything up to spread this good news. He was risking his life, eventually was murdered for his faith, like many Christians are in the Middle East right now. On Good Friday, many Christians were killed in Egypt, and as they were worshiping on Good Friday, they were murdered by ISIS. You see, what happens is you have to realize that because Jesus has risen from the dead, the fact that he loved you and still loves you means something. Now, last week I was preaching at Jesus Culture Sacramento. And uh, it was really a powerful time. And you know, when, when you struggle with sickness or you struggle with a hard time in your life, the nice thing about being about a church is people, everybody wants to pray for you. And, and that's really, well, not everybody, but a lot of people do. And it's a really cool thing. And so someone came up and they prayed with me and it really touched my heart because they said something. They said, God's going to heal you not because you're a good man. He's going to heal you because he loves you. Period. Period. Yeah, you could give God a hand clap for that one. Yeah, head with me to Romans chapter 8. See, this is, this is so cool. Moreover, if the spirit of the one who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, the one who raised Jesus from the spirit of the one who raised Jesus from the dead. If he lives in you, the one who raised Christ from the dead will also make your mortal bodies alive through his spirit who lives in you. I, you might be struggling with arthritis right now. You might have a family member that had a stroke or has cancer. You, you, you might have a, a death sentence and a diagnosis that's terrifying you right now and you're afraid of dying. But can I tell you something? He loves you. And because he loves you, the same spirit that raised him from the dead can live in you. See, you can walk away from the love of God. And you can walk away from the spirit. Or today you can say, I'm at ICLV on Easter Sunday or I'm watching online. And pastor's sharing his heart that today's a great day to rekindle a relationship that we might have walked away from. Today's a good day to actually start that relationship. And I can promise you one thing, that when you allow Christ to come back into your life by his spirit, guess what's going to happen? 
the same spirit that raised him from the dead now lives in you. Now, if that's true, many miracles can happen. If that's true, you have hope again. When we were worshiping, what rose up in me is just hope. Not just hope for me, but hope for you. Hope for my mom that she's going to have that peace and she's going to go to heaven. I've got that hope. The Bible calls it a blessed hope. See, if you're, if you're only you alone, you're based it on your own talent or some type of religion. But if you have a relationship with Christ, he fills you with his spirit. And on a daily basis, you remain in it. Remember, he said, I love because God loved me. I love you. Remain in my love. See, this third part is remaining in his love. You remain in his love when every day you say, Holy Spirit, give me strength, give me courage. Heal me, empower me, and help me love others. So what? He wants to do good for you. He's a good father. God's never thought of a way to hurt you. I learned this when I was young. People said, oh, they have cancer because God's punishing them. I heard that from people. Oh, they're going through a hard time because God's abandoned them. (laughs) That's what uh, we heard a lot in the first century. The blind beggar. He'd been told all his life, you're blind because God's cursed you. All the, all the people that were sick that Jesus encountered healed. If it be your will, you can heal me. Jesus healed them. Why? Because it has nothing to do with your righteousness. It has to do with a relationship. Does that make sense to anybody? Here's the second part. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4 through 9. It's a really great scripture that, that should rock your boat. It should really wake you up on this resurrection day. But God, being rich in mercy, we sang that, didn't we, about his mercy? Being rich in mercy because of his great love, which he loved us. Can you look at someone and say, God loves you? you. Do you believe it? No, honestly. Look at someone and say, I believe it. then why is it that we walk away from his love so often? Why is it that we just start going on our own steam and we start going on our own talents and we start going in our own desires instead of really living a life of just receiving the love of God, remaining in it so the rest of our life is based on love? See, when your your life is based on love, you're not as angry. You're not as anxious. Why? Because the love of God is being poured out into your life. Listen to this. Even though you were dead in transgressions, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you're saved. And he raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Now you may be sitting at ICLV right now or watching online, but can I tell you something? Part of your spiritual entity is seated at the right hand of the Father. You're seated with Jesus right next to him, and he's got that eternal place for you because God doesn't see things in time frames. You may live 50 years or 60 years or 70 years or 90 years. You may have a good long life. But ultimately, for a thousand years, you can rule and reign with Christ. Ultimately, for eternity, you can be in heaven. So God says this, he seats you in heaven. This is your position by right, seated with Jesus. That's a big deal. So he loves you? Yeah, it means that you've got a very special place in heaven, even right now. Verse 7, to demonstrate in the coming ages the surpassing wealth of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you're saved through faith. This is not of yourselves. It's a gift of God. It's not from works so that no one can boast. Do you remember when you were saved? Do you remember that day? The first time you invited Jesus to come into your life, forgive you for all your sins, and become the Lord of your life. you remember that day? I remember that day. I remember the days also that followed up where I would re-give my life to Christ and rededicate my life to Christ because I was going through a trial or tragedy and something of the sort. And You know, there's nothing wrong with that because rededication is a very powerful thing. It's okay. It's good to come back to God. If you've drifted away from his love, it's a good day to come back today. But the point here is that you're saved by grace, not by works, so that no one can boast. Are you ready for that? Isn't it kind of freeing that you don't have to do anything to be saved? You just have to receive it by faith. 
It's like someone saying, here's a million dollars, but if you don't walk up and grab it, it's not yours. Someone else will get it. So that benefit is sitting there for you. I love to tell the story when I was in uh, 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 Ontario during winter. I, I, Denise and I were there to preach, and uh, I rented a car. The funniest thing is, I'll never forget, it was like 25 below or 30 below zero. And as I got into the rental car, you know, leaving Vegas, have you ever sat into a car that was 20 below zero? Had leather seats. It's like sitting on an ice cube. And you can't concentrate for the first 10 minutes until, until the, or 15 minutes until the car starts warming up. It's about the third day. I suffered for three days. About the third day, I looked over there, and it was a Volvo, and it had a little push-button thing that had little squiggly wheels on it, and it was a heater, a seat heater. <laughs> this whole time, I could have started the car, pushed the heater seat, and gone in the hotel and come back, but I missed it. I didn't know it. It was there for me. I just didn't use it. I know a lot of Christians are like that. Re you know, Easter Sunday or Sundays are just religious duties, and they don't know the grace of God. They haven't received it, and they're not living in it. So today I want you to do this. Say, am I ready to receive the grace of God? I don't have to work for it. I have to receive it by faith. So what? John eleven twenty five 25 through 26. One of my favorite scriptures. I've done a lot of funerals through the years, and I don't do any more, but the team does. But the scripture that I always quote 99% of the time is John eleven twenty five. 25. Because it's the only thing that brings hope in the sight of grief. What do you say to a mom that just lost her daughter? Or a dad that just lost his son? What do you say to a man that just lost his wife or a woman that lost her husband in death? What do you say to someone that's in a grieving period of their lives? I mean, what can you do for them? If, if there's not the hope of eternal life, it's very depressing. I was in the hospital the other day and someone was screaming. I didn't know it was her birthday. Why am I here? Why am I here? For some reason, she was in a hospital room on her birthday. The family called in from other states and other cities, and the poor girl was suffering. I wanted to get up, but I was there for me that day. But John eleven twenty five 25 says, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live, even if he dies. And the one who lives and believes in me will never die. Woo! Do you believe this? Honestly, Jesus, it's his words. Either he was a liar, a lunatic, or he truly was the son of God. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. Not only was he going to be resurrected, he said he was the resurrection. So today on Resurrection Day, the question is whether you're living that resurrection relationship. Once you start living that resurrection relationship, and I'm speaking to Christians here, I'm speaking to non-Christians, I'm speaking to people that are here for the first time. I've met many Christians that are not living the resurrected life. They're afraid of death, they're afraid of rejection, they're afraid of failure. Fear seems to govern their life. But if you really believe in the resurrected one, if you really believe in the resurrection Jesus and in what he did and lived, that he was the first fruit of all resurrections. It says here that you'll never really die. I'll never forget the day that my dad died. I led him to the Lord. He, he had actually went to this church one time. And then right before he died, I had the privilege of leading him to the Lord. He actually had a vision of Christ. It was a, one of the most amazing gifts of my life. But I'll never forget the day he died. My mom was there, my sister Elaine and my family were all around his bed and, and we just, Isabel, who had had cancer as well, she was rubbing his head and my dad whispered to my wife and then he looked around the room and I was telling mom, mom, tell me he can go, tell me he can go. Because my dad wasn't gonna die, he was gonna transition. He was gonna transition to eternity. He was gonna, he was gonna even though he didn't live for the resurrected one in his whole life, he had made a decision before he died. And because he's not saved by works, he's saved by grace, my dad gets heaven just like I do. Woo! Do you believe this? 
I mean, recently I've had to really struggle with this concept of death. Not just because I've seen it all around me, but because I faced it. And it made me think about the fact that, number one, do I believe that I'm in transition? Whether it's today or 50 years from now or 30 years, it doesn't matter. The point is, am I ready? And I had to get ready. And then everyone I met around me, Mitch, I had to wonder whether they're ready for this experience of eternity. And that all of us are going to face it, and it's terrifying. One of the things with my mom recently, I've been working with her in terms of not being afraid of dying. She's 96. We've been talking about that. Because when she was growing up, it was really a religion of works. And so she's made a decision for Christ. She is born again. She's saved. But she still falls back on the works. And I tell her mom, she says, well, Paul, you're a good person. You'll go. I said, Mom, you're a million times better than me. I said, and, and the bottom line is, you're not going because of that. You're going because of grace. You're accepting the paid debt that Christ paid, and there he verified it by resurrection. So here, here's a couple of other thoughts. Um, does this make sense to you? Do you believe it? Do you believe it? All right, Jesus loves you. Now, here's the second thought. He loves everybody. <laughs> now, that doesn't diminish the fact on how important that love is, because I already told you. It means he can heal you, he can help you, he can bless you financially, he can change your life. The point is, is that he wants to do all these amazing things for you, and he'll never, never stop until the day you transition to the eternal life, which is also a, one of the benefits. But the, here's the other beautiful thing. It says, and join with me, go, go, jump down to, to uh, verse 12 and 13. We're back at John 15. Now John 15 says this. My commandment is this. Love one another just as I've loved you. Oh, there's a trickle down again. Father loved him, he loves us. Love others the same way. One of the most incredible things is as Christians... We are called to love. And that should make us different from any other person in this world. Any other, so Resurrection Sunday is telling me that by the time you leave here today, you are going to become one of the greatest commodities of our city and our state and our schools. You're going to become the one that can love. And not just love, but love like Christ. And that's the hardest thing in the world. I don't know about you, but have you ever tried to love someone unconditionally? Remember when you were, you got engaged? Oh, honey, I love you. You're beautiful. You're sexy. You're awesome. Or someone comes up to you and says, I want to get married. Why? Because they're beautiful. They're lovely. They're sexy. They're awesome. I always ask them why. And in counseling, we always ask them why. But what about this unconditional love? Love one another just as I've loved you. And I've had to realize this. I've been guilty of not loving my wife this way at times in my life. I've been guilty of loving other people. Not unconditionally. You've you got to think about this. Our world loves you based on what you do, how much money you have, how successful you are, or how you look, or whether you have the same opinion. You know, during the elections, there was a lot of debate, and there's still some protesting here and there, but people are really hating on each other. Not because of the looks, not because of the color, not because of the money. They're hating each other because of the other person's beliefs. Right now, just last week, or no, actually two days ago, ISIS said they were happy about the massacre in Egypt. They said, we love to kill Christians. Not because of our color or our background or our culture, but because of our faith. So the Bible says here that we're called to love one another just as I've loved you. So... So let's think about this for a second. Jesus loves us unconditionally. Yes? yes? He heals us, right? Yes. He blesses us, right? Yes. He only wants good for us, right? Yes. He's not judgmental, right? Yes. Have we ever been guilty of not loving the same way? Yes. Yeah, we, are, we have, have we? Our marriages would be 100 times better if we just loved the way Jesus did. Our friendships would be 100% better if we just loved the way Jesus did. In fact, our grandkids would grow up healthy if we just loved them. That's my number one goal when my grandkids come, just to love them unconditionally, no matter what they did. I don't know if my wife knows this, but the other day, 
some of my grandkids had scribbled on one of my beautiful um, office dressers, uh, not dre desks. It has leather too, but they, they scribbled in the leather too. And they put a bunch of numbers on the letters and then they actually carved it into the wood. I was so happy about that. <laughs> and then I went to the bathroom just a few days later and I, in our hallway and nobody else is there. We have an empty house right now, which we have the, we're in the empty, empty nest syndrome, which is awesome. And uh, that means I don't always close my door when I go to the bathroom. Someone say amen. <laughs> but this time I actually did close my door, Barry. And, and uh, I saw some writing on the back of the wall, honey. The writing says Jag. Jag's probably watching from Florida right now. It's okay, I forgave you, Jag. And my grandkids didn't know that I, I knew, but I, I love them unconditionally. And I just decided that my number one, let the parents discipline them, my number one goal is to love them. And Rick, you're a grandparent now, and I know you're going to feel the same way. Number one goal, let the parents discipline them. I'm just going to love them. Because that's how Christ loved. And then he says, my commandment, he didn't say my suggestion. He actually calls at another point a new commandment I give you. See, it's interesting because a, a commandment, and I, I check the Greek word, it means an order. So before he goes up to heaven, he goes, let me give you an order. Love everybody the way I loved you. Now notice the response was never, no, you stink, man. I'm offended. I'm hurt by you. You weren't a good lover. They could never say that about Christ. They always had to admit that he'd shown them well. Your children will love you the way you love them. Unless somehow they've had an amazing encounter with Christ. And then he'll take over from there. I failed a million ways as a parent. But I pray that Christ, I pray that Christ would love my kids and my grandkids. And make up for every one of my mistakes and faults. See, see that's the beauty of being a Christian. Is we have this amazing hope. And faith that not only does God love Jesus, Jesus loves me, and I'm called to love everyone else. I was, I was laughing the other day in prayer because I was, I, was, I was loving on some Democrats. And then I was even loving on some anarchists. And then I was loving on some Republicans I didn't like very much. And I loved on some independents I didn't like very much. And I just decided that I would take that in, into the political field and I would be known as the person that just loves them. You see, because if we just love people, it's not that we don't talk through issues. We have to. It's not that we don't resolve and speak about the truth. We have to. We speak the truth in love, Ephesians 4, 15. But the point is, we don't, we don't leave love. We remain in love. And if we remain in love, that's why we're a multicultural, multilingual church. Because we decided to be like this years ago, 24 years ago, I told everybody at ICLV, I said, gang, at the time we were only a white church. And I told our church, I said, we're going to be a multicultural church and we're going to honor uh, every background. We're going to honor women. Women are going to be able to share and preach from our pulpit. And, and uh, I said, we're going, to, we're going to love the teenagers. We're going to love the kids. We're going to love every color and every creed. Someone say amen. amen. Can you look around? Look around. Just see someone that doesn't look quite like you and tell them how good looking they are. Tell, say, man, you're good looking. You're just awesome. You're Filipino, you're Asian, you're Hawaiian, you're young, you're old, you're whatever. We love you! Yeah. Love you too, man. Okay, I'm going to close with this thought. I want the worship team come, to come up. Now here's the clincher, gang. One of the greatest things you can do tonight is to bring someone to the play. I know a lot of us are... We're kind of scared of sharing our testimony with somebody or maybe we've never led someone to Christ. If you just get them here, trust me, this play and the Spirit of God will win them. And so I'm going to ask you to do verse 13 here of John chapter 15. My commandment is this, to love one another just as I've loved you. No one has greater love than this, that one lays down his life for his friends. And then Jesus says, you are my friends.
Do you understand what he's saying here? Do you understand that, that today you and I have the ability to receive his love and not just receive it, but to remain in it. And not just to remain in it, but to love other people like that. So worship team, come up here. I don't know, there's some, oh, there they are, good. I want you to think about that for a second. I want you to really ponder that in your, your mind, whether you've accepted it, whether you've remained in it, and whether you're actually loving others as Christ did. Three questions. Have you ever received the unconditional love of Jesus Christ? If not, today's a good day. Some of you once did, but you've, you know, you walked away from it. Come on now, you know you have. It's time to come back. Say, sorry, Lord, that I walked away and I want to come back to that pool of love. Because that's, if you, in psychology, they call it the, the love tank. And a lot of times people don't have a love tank, so they don't love others and they can't love others. And a lot of times they can't even love themselves. But when you are really a Christian and really living it out, and that's why this church is here, because we love you. I don't care what your background is. I don't care what your history is. I don't care how many times you sin. I love you. God loves you. It's good enough for me. And I believe that somehow, some way, this day is going to help you live that out. And I want to throw out a challenge to you. Tonight's free. I want to encourage you to come back tonight. At, get here about quarter to six, five thirty. Be a little early because this place will be full. And I'm going to pray that your aunt gets saved tonight. That your uncle, who's depressed, gets set free tonight. I'm going to pray that that cancer patient comes tonight and it's not just being inspired, but will be healed tonight. I'm praying that, that somehow through your sacrifice, they'll come tonight. I can't make them come. I'm supposed to be resting. I just don't want to miss church. And I'm believing that tonight if you sacrifice, that maybe it's the day that your daddy's going to get saved. And maybe it's the day that your son's going to get saved. Just get him here. I, I, don't, I don't care if you have to treat him to a steak dinner. Bribery works. Take him to in and out or something or take him to a, get a salad and eat healthier or something like that. I'm doing a lot of that. That's why my two front teeth are growing more, aren't you? <laughs> I feel the presence of God moving in this place. Three questions, simple questions, not a complicated message, just a pile of love that will not just change one day, but this love will help you through every trial and every tragedy, and every temptation and every challenge. I'm offering you a, a love, a love that only God can show us and then we try to imitate that love to others.